First it was how to saw correctly, then it was how to chisel correctly, now how to plane correctly. I can't tell if I'm just milking it or not, or if we actually need to do this. I think we do. Let's get going. I've literally just realized there's something quite funny about this video. Those previous ones that I mentioned in the intro, how to saw correctly and how to chisel correctly. How to saw correctly was done in my first workshop. How to chisel correctly was done in my second workshop. And now here I am doing this in my third workshop. It's funny how things play out. So before we dive into this video, a few disclaimers. This is not a video on how to sharpen a plane. I've already done that video. Link is up here if you'd like to watch that. Disclaimer number two. This is not a video on how to set up a plane. I've also done a video on that, link is in the top corner. The sole purpose of this video is to show you techniques when using a plane to make it easier for you, to make your work more accurate, and to make the process of taking shavings from wood as enjoyable and pleasurable, for lack of a better word, as it should be. And also disclaimer number three, the things I'm saying in this video are from my own observations and experience, but the thing I like to preach a lot on this channel is there are no rules in woodworking. If something I show you doesn't work, don't see it as the only method to do it and therefore you can't do woodworking at all. That's not the case. If it doesn't work, don't do it, but I'm just gonna give you a few tips that have helped me and helped students that I've taught in the past few years that I've been doing woodworking. So let's get into tip number one. Tip number one, make sure this thing is actually sharp. You've missed the little thing in the top corner, but the link to that is in the description. Tip number two, make sure this thing is actually set up. You've also missed the thing in the top corner for that. Link for that is in the description as well. Make sure you watch those videos before delving into any of this. And I've always looked for an opportunity to say this and I never have. Do not, oh no, I've forgotten it. Do not run before you learn to walk, that's it. Make sure you get a good solid foundation, that you know how this thing works, you know how to set it up, then, apply the tips in this video to your work afterwards. So the first thing to sort out here is stance because this can really throw you off a of planing and make the process a lot more difficult than it should be because the way that people position themselves doesn't allow themselves to get enough power behind the plane when they're using it. So the most common thing I see is people standing side onto the work like this and then try and push it through like that. Now this plane is very sharp, very well set up and walnut is a lovely material to plane. But standing side on, can't help but feel the twisting motion of my back and my sides. There's a lot of like, energy and uncomfortableness within my body as I push it through like this. It's just, it's gonna knack me out very quick. So instead of positioning yourself like this and doing all that twisting action and ruining your back, stand behind the wood like this, get a nice wide stance, and then place the plane on the wood and literally use your back leg to push you through the cut. Over something this long, I don't even need to use my arms at all. It's all in my legs. This allows you to get a lot more power and control behind the plane because you could just stand here and use your arms, but that's gonna tire you out as well. If you've got a lot of plane in, they're gonna start aching as well. So use your feet to assist you with it, or sorry, your legs to assist you with it. So they just carry it through the cut, you get so much control. And if you're working with a longer board, yes, of course, you could use both of them in conjunction with each other. So push your legs through as you're extending your arms. That works quite nicely, but you'll find it's just a lot more enjoyable and you get a better flow because you're just rocking back and forth as you're planing, it's just, it's quite nice. <laughs> so that's the position where our lower body should be. Down here, wide stance, and you get good power transfer from it. Now, it's still possible that you could do this, but you could still have trouble with the upper body side of things. Usually this comes from positioning elbows out here, elbow round here. You see it kinks my wrist. What this does is, if your elbow's out here, as I plane it forward, the way it naturally unfolds is it goes off like that. Likewise, if I fold it towards me, firstly, it's kind of pushed my legs out the way, so I'm not able to get as much power behind it. And also, it's sort of making me go off to the left like that. Now, we have put a very, very small curve on this blade, which was covered in my video, how to get a stupidly sharp edge on a plane blade. Like I said, the link to that is in the description. If you haven't watched that yet, please watch it. Because that little trick of putting a curve on the end of a plane blade just solves so many problems, specifically when it comes to jointing edges. If we're trying to square up this edge to the face here, and this edge is too high, 
we can simply center the plane along this edge and it takes more of a shaving off that side than it does on the left hand side or your right hand side. Likewise, if this side is higher, center the plane there and it takes more of a shaving off that side. So this is really handy in 95% of cases, but if you have your elbow kinked out here and you do this, it's gonna be nice and even at the start, but then as it unwraps and you go off to the right or the left, whatever, it's gonna be even here and then you're gonna dip off that corner. Also, if you come from here, it's really uncomfortable and you'll probably go off to the left or your right and that corner will dip off. The way to get around this is to obviously meet in the middle. Get your elbow, wrist, plane all in line with each other and then just push it through the cut like that. I sometimes push my elbow into the side of my body because it just gives it a little bit extra location, doesn't feel like it's floating around at all and just push it through the cut like that. And the other thing that a few people do here is they hold the handle with a full on death grip like that. All four fingers wrap around the handle like that and they're just all crunched up in there and it's not very nice. Just point your finger down the frog like that. There's a lovely little area here that's cast out and it fits your index finger beautifully. I sometimes even do the rock on dude sign. You know the old horns? Yeah. I sometimes do that because it just gives me extra location and it means that these fingers here aren't as bunched up and just makes it a lot nicer to hold. Now a word of warning, if you're not used to any of these techniques and things like that, it's gonna feel a little bit robotic for you when you do this, like all your elbows locked into position, your feet are just sort of rocking forwards and back like that. It doesn't feel very natural, but what I'd encourage you to do is make a conscious effort to do this. Focus more on pushing down on top of the plane than you are pushing forward with your arms. Let your legs do that bit, all your weight on top, and just let it rock through like that. It's gonna feel robotic, but the more and more you do it, eventually you're gonna start being able to relax because your muscle memory is gonna allow you where to put the pressure, how much pressure to apply. You're gonna get into a better motion with it. Things will just eventually loosen up, but for the time being, just focus on getting that technique right and eventually it'll evolve into something that's really comfortable for you. So when I was jointing large edges, like in the bass guitar video, I was doing all of the techniques I've just shown you, but you'll see that it was just a lot smoother. There was a lot more power behind it, but I was getting some lovely controlled and consistent shavings flying out the mouth of that plane. Likewise, in my Rubo workbench series, again, same thing. I've been practicing this technique for years and it's eventually boiled down into something that I feel incredibly relaxed with. And then when I need really fine precision when I'm planing, like when I was doing the chopping board video, you'll see I'll slow down quite a lot. I'll make sure I'm steering the plane in the right direction and being very careful about where I'm taking that shaving from. It all comes down with practice. It's not gonna feel comfortable to start with, but eventually you'll just be able to sort of relax into it and it won't take a lot of effort at all and you'll get lovely things like this flying out your plane. So now we've got the stance all sorted out, let me just give you a few extra pointers and things to look out for when you're planing. You'll see here that we've got some lovely shavings coming out of this plane. This is an already plane surface, it's nice and flat and it doesn't require much cleaning up from here. If you have a rough sawn edge, such as from a band saw, a hand saw, even a table saw, you're gonna get little bumpy bits like this, and when you skim the plane over it, it's not gonna take anything. Reason for that is because it's just taking off those high points. However, a lot of people see this and they think, oh look, I'm hardly getting anything out. That means I need to bring the blade out a bit. Okay, still not quite doing it. Bring the blade out a bit more. Oh, okay, well. I guess that's almost a shaving. Let's keep going. Ah, oh, there you go. It's moved in the vise. I'll just reclamp it up, do it a bit tighter. Here we go. And then before you know it, you're making veneers. If you're planing a rough sawn edge, my advice to you, be patient. Let the plane do its work and eventually you'll be able to take lovely shavings from the mouth of the plane not thick veneers like this. It makes the process so much more enjoyable if this is taking off less material as opposed to something like this. So here we go, let's get the plane set up again so it's taking nice shavings. There we go, so this is off the smooth edge. Now let's flip it over to a new rough sawn edge. We'll leave exactly the same setting on it and we'll just let it take off those high points.
almost there. And it's got a few little bits in the middle there. There we go. Lovely shavings from a rough sawn edge. Hardly any effort at all. I'm not out of breath. That was quite enjoyable, really. So now the rough sawn edge is gone, but we have just been attacking this with a plain willy-nilly and hoping for the best. If we check it for square, yeah, you see it's not square at all along the length of it. This side here, your left, is too high. Now you could just try and center the plane along this high side and take a shaving across it like that. Trouble is, when you hold the handle at the front like that, my hand is sort of covering the area in front of the plane and I can't really see where I'm going. The only thing I can see is, I don't know, from about here in front of my plane and also what's going on in the mouth. This area here is completely blind. So it means that squaring up the edge is just a bit more of a guessing game than it should be. What you can do here is actually hold it so your finger is underneath the plane like this in front of the blade. Now, disclaimer, I am not responsible for you poking the blade. That is up to you. Be wary of where your hands are or where your fingers are. This works a lot better with jack planes because the front on them is a lot longer than it is on a smoothing plane. But a way to sort of prevent you from poking that really sharp blade is to wrap your index finger around the front of the plane like that. So it can't actually poke back far enough to hit the blade. So wrap it around like that and then your thumb is sort of floating here. Just wrap that around the handle like this. And then what you can do is you can center the plane along the width of the material, whichever side is too high, and then you can use your finger as a fence running up and down the side of the material. So not only do you have that side to side location locked in place, but you can also see in front of the plane as well. So if you've got a high point that's here and a high point that's on the opposite corner, I can center it here. I can see where I need to steer that plane. I can start moving the finger fence to the side and then shift it across the other way. Or if I wanted to go straight down the center, lock my finger fence into place and then just push it through. So now I can see where I'm going and I can also feel where the plane is going as well. Again, it feels super unnatural when you first do it, but what it does is it forces you to slow down with it, which is always a good thing because it means you're taking more controlled shavings and your technique is gonna be better rather than just doing that kind of thing. But do not poke the bottom of the plane. It will hurt, or if it's sharp, it probably won't hurt, but you'll be bleeding everywhere, which isn't ideal. But saying that second disclaimer, I can't promise it won't hurt if you do cut yourself. So now we're gonna look at skewing the plane, but first we need to take this blade out so I've set my blade up in the honing guide and I've made a protrusion stop to make sure that when the honing guide hits this edge and the blade hits my stop here, that is at 30 degrees. I have done a video on how to make one of these things. The link is in the top corner if you want to watch that and is also in the description if you missed the link up there. So that is now at 30 degrees, give or take a few degrees here and there. What matters with jigs like this is the repeatability and consistency every time you set it up, not whether this turns out at 29 degrees or 31 degrees. It's about it being consistent. So let's see what we've got here. If I zero this bevel box to my workbench, there we go, zero degrees. And we elevate the blade so that it rests on the bevel and then stick this on there. Let's see what that says. Oh, so close to 30 degrees. How about that? So that means that when I'm using the plane straight on like this, the shaving is having to travel up a 30 degree slope when it is separated from the material. However, watch what happens here if I skew the plane to the side and then tilt the bevel box so it is in line with you. Let's see what we got there. We have now got 20.6 degrees. So just by skewing the plane and the angle that this is sitting on there, we have now lowered the effective pitch of the plane to 20.6 degrees. So that means that despite sharpening a 30 degrees on this, if I skew this like that, the effective pitch of this plane is now gonna be around 20 degrees. If I skew it a little bit less, it might be around, I don't know, 25 degrees. And if I skew it right round like this, and I take that shaving, that's gonna be, Oh, God knows how shallow that is of an angle. But by skewing the plane, what you're effectively doing is lowering the effective pitch or the cutting angle of the plane itself. And if you think about it, this is, in a weird sort of way, it's similar to climbing a mountain. If you're at the base and you're looking at the summit, it's incredibly steep. Like, you look at it and you think, blimey, what a task that's going to be. But then you see that little gravel path going up and it's zigzagging 
up the side of the hill. And because it zigzags across the hill, as opposed to going straight up, it means that it's less of an incline. You still get from the base to the summit, it takes you a little bit longer, but it's not as steep. You're just going side to side, up the blade, up the blade, up the mountain. I'm forgetting about all the metaphors I'm using here. So here you go, if you look at this blade, that is effectively our mountain. We're going from the base to the summit and it's pretty steep to be honest. But if I simply skew this round a bit, look at the angle of this ruler now. The angle is much more shallow simply because the angle of attack at the bottom of the blade is at an angle as opposed to going straight up the blade like that. It took me ages to get my head around it, but then once I realized it's the same as climbing a mountain, it just sort of makes sense there. Oops. So why does this matter? Well, what we've got here is a little bit of reversing grain, and that's where the grain is coming against me. So if I plane it, it's likely to tear out. Now, this bit of timber is behaving quite nicely, and I promise this video wasn't a plug for all of my other videos that I have done, but if you want to know more about reducing tear out, grain direction, angles of blades and things like that, then watch my video, how to reduce tear out with the hand plane. Links in the top corner. It's also in the description as well, because the things I'm saying in this video are only a little snippet of what's in that video. And the things I said in that video will give you a lot more clarity as to what's going on here. So by attacking this straight on, it's a little bit crunchy, but it's not too bad. So this shaving is traveling up a 30 degree slope at the moment. If I skew this a little bit and therefore lowered the effective pitch of the plane blade, if I push this through, it just digs in a little bit more. And these shavings, you can hear them, they're just a little bit more crunchy. This surface is, like I say, it's behaving quite well, but it feels a lot furrier than it did if I was to just pass over it with the 30 degree effective pitch by going straight on like this. It's not nice, but these shavings feel a lot nicer. So be wary of that. If you skew the blade, you're gonna lower that angle and you might end up getting a little bit more tear out than you would do if you were to push the plane forward like this. However, by skewing it like this, it means that you get a cleaner cut because a lower angle generally means a cleaner cut. And because of that lower slicing action going on, it tends to be a little bit easier to push the plane through. So there's advantages and disadvantages to it because the other thing it does is it shortens the length of the sole. If I've got it going straight on like this, I've got a long sole to reference off and it's more likely to make this board flat. Whereas if I skew it, it's going to sort of follow more of those contours and it's not going to be as flat. But you might not want this surface to be perfectly flat or it doesn't need to be perfectly flat. At the end of the day, you just want to clean it up. If there's a few small bumps on it, it doesn't matter. If that's the case, skew it. Let it follow those bumps and you'll get a nicely plain surface without needing to go through all the effort of trying to find all those high points along here and let it work down evenly. It's about finding what works for you, but also realizing if it's tearing out horribly, then it might be because you're skewing it too much or you need to sharpen a steeper angle on your blade or increase the pitch of the frog. Again, that's all detailed in my video, how to reduce tear out. So if it's a common problem for you, give that a watch. Link is in the description. And finally, my last little tip for you, candle wax. Just a little tea light or a little candlestick, whatever. Candle wax. You'll see that if I just move this out of the way. I've brought the blade all the way back and I'm just gonna slide it along my workbench. It slides pretty well at the moment. Put a bit of candle wax on the bottom. Just a little scribble like that, nothing too fancy. And then watch this. <laughs> it makes, it cuts down on that friction and it slides a lot easier along the material that you're planing. And yeah, it makes the process a lot easier, especially if, like I said at the start, you wanna practice by pushing down on top of the plane. If there's a lot of friction on the bottom of your plane anyway, then by adding your weight on top of that, it's gonna make it a lot more difficult. Scribble candle wax on the bottom and it just glides. It's lovely. So, I hope you found this video useful. If you have any other questions at all, be sure to chuck them in the comments. A great practice project for this is my chopping board project. The link is also in the description as well as all the other videos that I've referenced. I'll put them in an order that's sort of easy to digest so you can work out what level you're at. Say, I know how to sharpen, I know how to set it up. Oh, but I don't know about tear out, I'll click that. Or if you don't know how to sharpen, you can start at the top and work your way down. But if you apply all the things in those videos as well as this one, then your planing will just be it'll be game changing for you. It will make your woodworking so much better, more enjoyable. And when it clicks, it's amazing. Absolutely mind blowing. So 
thank you very much for watching. If you haven't subscribed, be sure to click that big button down there and like the video as well. It really helps. Sharing the video would also be greatly appreciated. And thank you to those of you who support me on Patreon. A link to that is also in the description as well. So if you want to support the channel by donating whatever amount you wish, again, I would be incredibly thankful for that. So thank you for watching. See you in the next video. Thank you.